Welcome to our Research Like a Pro with DNA question and answer series. And today we are going to talk about how to document lines of descent from a most recent common ancestor to a DNA match. So this question came in wanting to know what are ways to write up documentation for lines of descent from a most recent common ancestor to a DNA match. When we are writing our reports, and especially when we're doing a proof argument, we may have a beautiful table like this one that Nicole did for her proof argument on the father of Barsheba Tharp Dyer. And we can't just put a document out here and expect everyone to believe that these lines are correct going back up to this ancestral couple. We have to do some kind of documentation and we have to do some kind of proof. But how do we do that? So we're going to spend just a few minutes giving you some ideas and discussing this whole issue. So first of all, why even worry about documenting? Well, we would document everything in our genealogy because we can't expect anybody reading our work to just believe us because we've seen too much genealogy like that in the past where we were just expected to believe some parent-child links. Back in the day, we see that in written compiled genealogies. So when working with DNA, we especially need to document those links from our test takers up to our most recent common ancestor, and then the DNA matches to our test takers. So it gives us necessary evidence. We're always looking for evidence. And if we are going to use DNA for a proof argument or a report even, we want to make sure we're adding the evidence that's needed. So there are some challenges of showing these parent-child links. For one thing, it is a lot of documentation. So in the diagram I showed you that Nicole had done, we had a lot of links. And so for each link, you might have two or three citations showing that proof of parent to a child. And so where do you put all of this? Do you put it in the body of the report where it may take up several pages? Do you put it in an appendix? Do you cite a different place for someone to go find that? You know, we're going to talk about some of the possibilities, but it really comes down to that often it takes a lot more space than we have. And another challenge is clearly showing the information. We can't just throw a bunch of citations out there to our reader without clearly explaining what they refer to and having an organized format so that we understand what we're referring to when we go back and look at it. So we've got to think of how to organize it, how to be more clear. So there are some possibilities. We generally will want to have some type of a figure or which would be a diagram visualizing that. It's always helpful for our readers to have something visual. And often we have a bit of narrative, some writing in the paragraph form before or after the figure explaining what we are showing. And then we want to have some place for that documentation. So some of the different things you could do, you could have a table and you could have all of the citations in a single merged cell. This maybe would work if you didn't have a huge diagram. If you do have a very large diagram with a lot of links to show, maybe you have an appendix with a bulleted list for all the documentation, or perhaps you are going to direct your readers to a family tree with all that documentation. So those are some specific ways you could handle this. And I thought we would look at some of the most recent articles from the National Genealogical Society Quarterly that had DNA. So these were all published in 2023, and each author went about it a little bit differently, trying to show how they documented those parent-child links. So the first one we'll look at was an example of the diagram. They all have the diagram. And in this example, Catherine Damaris sent people to her website. So this was for her article, was Nancy and Northheimer, DNA helps identify a Revolutionary War militiaman's daughter. And this came out in June of 2023. So in the article, Catherine directs people to her website, which is Stonehouse Genealogy. And here you can see what you would see when you went to that page within the article. And I think it's interesting just to see how she organized this. So she is referring back to figure one, which was for selected DNA test taking descendants of Jacob and William Northamer, sons of Nicholas Northamer. So notice that this very first 
and I'm going to enlarge this so we can see this. This very first source she has is an article that she actually authored. And so she did a proof argument basically for her first link. And so that can be something if we've already done a lot of research, maybe we have some indirect evidence. We don't have an actual document showing the proof of a parent-child link. We may be using something like that, which is our own personal research we've done. Now, also notice that for each person that we are looking at, for each generation going back, she has just got that bolded, and then she has the specific source, and so she's chosen to group all of those things all together, so it basically is one big paragraph or one big cell in a table, perhaps. So if you were doing something like a merge cell in a table, perhaps above this, you would have um, some different facts in your table, and then you would have, this could be your, you could have your diagram in the, the table, basically, and then this would be all of your documentation. Some of the records that she used for the links are what we commonly see with genealogy proofs, things like church records, census records, birth, marriage, and death records that all were used to prove parent-child links. And as I showed you, she did cite a previous article for one of her links, which was another proof argument. So this is one way you could do that. And if you didn't have a website, this was up for a published article in the NGSQ, and it could not be included in the journal because there simply wasn't room, which is why she sent people to her website. So if you are writing your own proof argument and there is no limit on how how long it is, you certainly could do something like this in an appendix so that you still have all of that right there with the report. And someone who's interested in seeing all those links would simply go to your appendix. Now, another article that came out in December of 2023 is Elizabeth Schoen Mills identifying a teenage mother in rural pre-1850 America. The fan suggests and AT, autosomal DNA confirmed Shadrach Odom's first wife. And in this example, Elizabeth has a diagram and she sends this to her ancestry public tree and to her website. So she's giving the reader a few choices. <clears throat> so here is her basic uh, pedigree chart. And in the article she wrote, every generational link, date, place, and identity is documented in the author's public tree with information privatized only for living individuals. So basically, if you were reading the article, you could go to this tree, you could look up each person mentioned in the tree and see their place in the pedigree. These little uh, red symbols indicate notes that she has made for these different people. So this is something else that you could possibly do. But also in her article, she says, 18 pages of documentation for the charts have been posted as an appendix at the author's website, Historic Pathways Under Research, Sessoms. And so then you would go to her website and you would look for the appropriate page and be able to see the documentation there. So that is another way that perhaps you would be able to show your work, especially if you were limited on space. And then finally, we have Karen Stanberry's article from June 2023, and this was a charming scandal and a tragic victim, Charles Mapes and Maggie McBurney of Rock Island County, Illinois, biological parents of Myrtle Ava Porta Dewin. And in this case, Karen, again, has the diagram and she sends us to her website. And on her website, she has this basically an appendix, but she has this linked to her article and she has different figures. And so for each figure, she will have a list of all the documentation for that figure. And just notice that she has organized this a little bit differently. In this case, she has not put it all into one paragraph like we saw with the Damaris article, but she has it listed out separately for um, for different descendants and then for different people. 
we can see that she made it very, very clear. And I like this that she, we don't, we're not guessing. She says, for Ethel Higginbotham Hoxie to her mother, Julia D. Phipps Higginbotham C. And so we see right away, we know exactly what we would find if we were to look at this, a death certificate. We would see a parent-child link with that. And the same with this one where we see it's a 1900 census. In this case, we see that it's a public member tree. So it's always interesting to look at these types of things and see what the author is citing for a parent-child link. So I thought this was a nice way of organizing this. It's really clear. It's easy to read. And we can see exactly how that diagram would be documented. Now, for Nicole's example that I showed you at the very, very beginning, she included an appendix. And so here we see that she has some specific DNA matches here. And she's anonymized this so that this could be um, made public. So if you are going to write a proof argument and you want to upload it to, say, Family Search or your Ancestry Tree, you would do something like this. Either you would get permission from your DNA matches or you would anonymize them. And in this case, we can see that this was group C and each one has a number, C1, 2, 3, and such. And so for documentation of parent-child links in figure three, we see the appendix. And then here we have sources for figure three. And again, nicely lined up here, bold for the specific person we're looking at. And then we have one source showing uh, lots of censuses here. And we see that this is how we know that these people are connected um, from a parent to a child relationship. So here's an interesting one I'll point out that for Mary's daughter, she is living and documentation for her parents is privately held by Nicole Dyer. So we'll have different circumstances, different situations as we work through something like this for our own project. So if you are interested in looking at this, this is in our book as a work sample. A genealogist's guide or research like a pro of DNA, a genealogist's guide to finding and confirming ancestors with DNA evidence. And you can read the entire proof argument and you can see exactly how Nicole did the documentation. Now, this is all well and good for a finished product, but what do we do when we're actually working through our research project? How do we deal with something like this? So I have some ideas here for a workflow as you're starting your project and as you're doing your research. We are often just amassing a large group of DNA matches, and we don't know at the beginning which ones we will actually want to use in a proof argument. So as we are working with a DNA match, we would choose a match, perhaps it's in a cluster or it's a shared match with someone that we feel like is an important piece of our project. So we would add them to Airtable, get started with, you know, adding their match page and the amount of DNA shared. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the next step that I like to do, I like to right away diagram the connection to the most recent common ancestor. And I do prioritize finding the DNA matches that have a tree so that I can do this. If they don't have a tree, then it's very difficult to diagram them. So then I will diagram them. And then as I look at the tree and as I verify each link, I will change the color of the box. So I start out with white boxes for each of those generational links. And as I verify it, I will turn it to gray so that I know I have seen with my own eyes, at least one or two records showing that I believe that link is correct. And then I like to add the match to my ancestry tree, either as a floating branch, if I don't know exactly how they connect to my tree or with the appropriate connection. And then in that tree, I like to add the sources needed to prove that generational link. So I typically will add some censuses, uh, an obituary is great, vital records like a death certificate, but I want to make sure I have got those sources in my tree so that when I go to work on a report or a proof argument, I know what sources I was using.
I do not add these sources yet to my Airtable research log because I'm not sure which ones I'm going to actually end up using. I let them just stay in my tree and I let my diagram tell me that I have verified those different links as I'm going up the tree to the common ancestral couple. Then when it is time to actually do some writing, and typically we will write the report first, and we may have a few different reports that we actually then combine into a proof argument, that's when we can choose the best matches to illustrate. So perhaps we have got 30 matches that we have explored and they're all in a big diagram. Do we need to discuss every single match and every single um every single link going back to the MRCA. No, we do not have to. And uh, the next slide, I'll tell you some ideas for choosing best matches. But once we have this big diagram, we can just make a copy of that. We can duplicate that base diagram, and then we can edit it to show only the best matches. We can eliminate all the others that we don't necessarily want to discuss in our report or our proof argument. And then this is the time where we can go ahead then and pick one, maybe two sources that we want to use to document those links. And that's when we can create the citations. Once we have picked our best matches, and then we can organize those into however we want, an appendix, a bulleted list, and a table, however we want to do that. So this will save us effort and help in being really judicious with who we choose to include for our final writing product. So here's some ideas for best matches. We want to look for independent child lines of the most recent common ancestral couple. Make sure we've got, um, if possible, a DNA match coming down through each of the children. And then we also want to prioritize the higher amounts of shared centimorgans if possible. It is good if we can prioritize people that have a clear path to the most recent common ancestor. And as we saw in some of our examples, there may, may be a point where we really don't have a clear path and we have to write a bit of a proof argument just for one specific generation, and that's okay. And then we want to make sure that we are using people that are matching our other test takers, that are, that are all people within the same genetic network, making sure that we have got a group of people that all match each other and that come down through this common ancestral couple. So picking out our best matches is really something that we can do all the way through a project, but specifically at the end when we're deciding who we want to use to illustrate to prove our point. So hopefully this has given you some ideas of what you can do when you are in the midst of your research and also when you are ready to get started with your proof argument and writing up how you know what you know. Thank you.